Well, well Brendan, Brendan Brannock was a, was a civil servant who worked in the Department of Agriculture, who was uh, who learnt the pipes, I think, from, uh, from, from the pots. And he was a very, very, very keen interest, academic interest in the music, and who decided, quite rightly, that uh, a national collection of dance music should be undertaken. So he, he started this particular uh, project, uh, going around collecting all, mainly the, the Kjol Rink and the Heron Volume 1, I think, is probably musicians who are all Dublin-based. Sonny Brogan, John Kelly, all the, the, those musicians who were around at the time. And then he decided that really, like that for this to, to work, it needed to be done on a full-time basis. So he was very, very fortunate that, uh, I think he knew Paddy Hillary, who was the minister at the time who arranged for him to be seconded from the Department of Agriculture to the Department of Education to undertake this collection. And uh, so I, I remember, because I was going to school in, the, in, just in this building just down from it, so I used to be coming home from school and I could hear this tin whistle, and it would be Brannock in writing down the tunes that he'd collected from different musicians. And then it was true, it, that was how the trip to Donegal came about. He asked my father to arrange the trip to go to see John Doherty. But interestingly, like, he didn't include any of that music in, in, uh, for a while. He had actually decided that Donegal music shouldn't be in it. I mean, there are no highlands, there are no cetaceous in any of those collections. So he made a decision. That for, for, I don't know what the reason was, but a uh, uh, question about what I would have thought as well. Uh, but anyway, they didn't feature, and they didn't feature until he, I think, he started adding to the collection on the basis of commercial recordings. So I don't, I don't ever remember Brendan recording Tommy. I wouldn't know anyway, because that would be between the pair of them. But uh, in terms of Donegal music, I, I, I don't think it, it, it sort of featured, you know. Uh, I think it was a, an unfortunate uh, decision. I wouldn't agree with it editorially. Um, I suppose Tommy would have been one of the younger people. That, um, I chatted to Jackie Small in the context that we were doing a programme about Frankie Gavin. You mentioned yeah. that the two yeah. younger people in Brana's collections were Frankie Gavin and Tommy Peoples. Yeah. Um, so he, I'm, I'm assuming that a collector would go for something that is rare and uh, about to fall off the cliff, Sonny Brogan, etc. Yes. Kind of the older musicians would have been a big thing for younger musicians like that to be included. Oh, absolutely. Of course it would. Yeah, and, and rightly so. And what you said would have been rare would have been certainly rare in the case of Tommy. And rare again to have a teenager yeah. playing composi com his own compositions. Yes, absolutely. And absolutely, that's the way it should be. But very rare. Wouldn't have happened that often, you know. Uh, but most of those tunes, I'm sure Joe Cassidy would have had them and people before them. And people before Joe would have, would have had those tunes, you know. Um, people like Paddy Douglas, I'm sure, would have, would have known all those tunes, you know. Uh, there, there would have been. But Tommy was the first I'd have heard playing them. Although there were plenty of others, and there were, there were very good fiddle players around, around St. Johnson at the time. You know, the Paddy Douglas, uh, John Douglas, George Peoples, and uh, there, there were others as well. That they don't, uh, their names don't, don't spring to mind at the moment, but... There were, there were, the place was full of music, full of music. Every house really had a fiddle hanging from the brace. Uh, you'd have a, maybe a range, a Stan, Stanley eight, number eight range going and a brace above it. And you could have maybe two or three fiddles hanging, like Ronnie, I think, and four or five fiddles hanging above the brace. Uh, and these would all have been, these would all have been played by Tommy when he was a boy and such, you know. And uh, they would have been male, uh, Tommy's Uncle Mathis fiddles would have been hanging there as well. Um, but as far as the, those tunes were concerned, Tommy was the first I'd hear playing them. East Donegal, I get, a, I get the feeling that there was, there was an awful lot of music there that needed to be collected and maybe wasn't then. Quite possibly. I mean, I'm sure Cathy McGinley probably was the closest thing you had to, to um, um, a, a collection of the music in the area. Um, and without her, there'd probably be no trace at all, really. Um, like I said, going, going on holidays there, I never met musicians. Very, very rarely. He would point out different houses um, and say who lived there and this one played fiddling. Um, I remember going to visit George's house one time when we were very small. 
Uh, but again, there was no music, it was all talking and tea, you know. Um, but again, that, that side of Donegal back in the day, you know, was, as I said before, was very suppressed. You know, there was a dominance there of, by the English that, you know, they really, I'd say, it could have been dangerous to express the fact that you all played this music, but it, the music became even more vital because of it. You know what I mean? Um, so I'd say that the gatherings would have been very quiet and not really spoken about as such. So it's quite possible that people from outside the area wouldn't know those musicians were there. Um, because again, it was, it was, they were trying to, you know, stay under the radar and, and try and survive.